Thank you uh, for sticking around till the close to the end. I appreciate everybody hanging around uh, here today. Um, I'm going to talk about human data interaction, which is something that um, we've been thinking a lot about. Um, you know, we, there's a lot of discussion about AI, machine learning, a lot of the data science stuff we talked about at the conference over the last couple of days, and we've been thinking a lot about the humans that drive that technology and, and how do they interact with the technologies that we're, we're thinking about. So I talk pretty fast and there are going to be a lot of slides, so if you want to <laughs> follow along at home, my slides are all up here at jtleak.com slash talks. Um, so I'm going to start with what we've come to think of as the AI paradox. And so this is what the AI paradox is. You read a lot of news stories like this. Um, so Alpha uh, Zero AI beats champion chess program after teaching itself uh, in four hours. So the machines are beating the humans. Um, robots could replace up to 1.7 million American truckers in the next decade, which would replace the largest job class that exists in the United States. So that would be a big deal. Um, Automation threatens 800 million jobs, but technology could save us, says report. So on the one hand, you're hearing a lot of hype around um, AI and those technologies. Um, my favorite is this one. You will lose your job to a robot, for sure, and sooner than you think. Unless we think we're um, safe for this, um, Google is already rolling out tools to understand our genomes. That's what I do professionally at Johns Hopkins, so that made me a little nervous. Um, Watson's next feat, taking on cancer. They're going to solve cancer, too. That's great. Um, and then, you know, if you're a data scientist or a data engineer, you don't get off easy either. Apparently, the robots are going to automate and take away all of our jobs as well over the next couple of years. So on the one hand, there's incredible hype and excitement around these sort of uh, ideas, and the technologies are getting better and better. Um, and so should we just shut it down and like, okay, we'll just turn it over to the robots and everybody goes home and takes it easy. Um, and the, the, the thing that creates the par paradox is that there's the opposite thing happening sort of at the very same time. So uh, this is a, a blog post that was written by a colleague of mine, Stephen Salzberg. He's quite a famous computational biologist at Johns Hopkins. And he talks about how Google's AI program can't build your uh, genome sequence. Um, th at the same time, in, at least in my area in academia, you get these headlines like most science research findings are false. So how can all of our statistics and our data science and our AI be perfect in solving all the world's problems and at the same time everything is wrong and everything is broken? Um, and so you're reading all these kind of countervailing pieces and we're just trying to make sense of those and that's what we thought of as this sort of AI paradox. And so we thought maybe at the beginning that the robots might take all our jobs, but maybe not quite yet. The robots aren't totally ready for prime time. If you take nothing home from my talk today, you should just follow um, Simone Gertz, who does Shitty Robots. This is a channel worth following on YouTube if you take nothing else from my talk today. Um, so uh, we came up with a hypothesis for why there are these two countervailing things. The AI is going to cure everything versus everything is broken hypotheses. Um, so we had an idea, and as with most of our ideas in academia, it, hold your breath to decide whether it's a good one or not. We, you'll, you'll have to decide for yourself at the end of the talk. So let's think a little bit about this project. This is the one I know the most about. Google rolls out an AI tool for understanding genomes. So the way that this article makes it sound like what has happened is you go in with a cough to your local doctor. They sequence your genome. Google takes care of it, and then you're better. Now, that's sort of what the article makes it sound like, but the reality is there's a lot of stuff that's going on under the hood here. So first of all, when you come in and they want to get information about your DNA, there's a lot of ste steps that go into that process. First of all, if we're studying DNA, it doesn't make any sense to just study your DNA. We have to study everybody's DNA in order to find out what's wrong with people. And we have to decide whether we're going to run what's what are called family-based studies, where we get DNA from your parents and from you, or whether we need to run population-based studies. That's a human decision that has to go into how we collect the data. This is a piece, a little chunk of a DNA molecule. Each of you has uh, your own unique sequence. It's three billion letters long. You don't need to know very much about genetics to follow along here. The way that the machine works that sequences your DNA and has dropped the cost of sequencing a human genome from $100 million to under $1,000 over the last 10 years is they break it up into tiny little fragments and you can sequence all those fragments simultaneously really cheaply, and then you try to puzzle it back together like a gigantic jigsaw puzzle overlapping the little pieces. So that's how the sequencing technology works. And so you sequence these short fragments, and you try to put them back together, and that's how we actually find out what's going on in your DNA. 
And what they do is they basically, this is a reference sequence, a reference DNA sequence that we got from one person in 2000. And we line up all the little fragments we get from you when you come into the doctor's office. And we see if you have a T where you should have a C in the sequence. And then we try to correlate that with some kind of disease that you might have. What Google did was they turned this into an image processing problem. They did this exact same pileup, but instead of actually looking at the letters and making a text processing problem, they color coded the letters and made it an image processing problem that allowed them to predict whether somebody had a T or a C. Now that is one tiny, tiny sliver of what has to go on in order to be able to actually make a diagnosis. You have to decide to do it. How do you do the image processing problem? How do you decide the convolutional uh, layers in the neural network, et cetera? So that's one part of it. That's just getting the DNA. Then once we have the DNA information, what do we do with it? Do we diagnose you? Do we try to treat you? Do we use it as a biomarker to say whether we should give you that drug or the other? These all involve a huge number of decisions made by a clinician in the clinic. Then things happen. DNA, you may not know this, but DNA, like software, has versions. We release a new version of the human genome every couple of years. It gets updated. And every time we update it and correct little pieces of it, Sometimes what we thought was an error in your DNA turns out to be we just made a mistake in the reference genome and now we have to go back and correct everything we did. This is again a human step that goes into this data analysis. So that's just at the study design level, how do we actually get the data in-house? But now let's pick on one particular person at random and their individual analysis. I've selected a person completely at random from the entire world's population of data scientists. He's my neighbor down the hall, Roger Peng. And we are going to pick on his particular data analysis. So he was studying the relationship between air pollution and health outcomes, in particular cardiovascular risk outcomes. And so he got this very famous paper in a journal that all academics would kill to get into called JAMA on this topic. And he fit a model that re it was called a Poisson regression model that relates uh, PM 2.5, which is a measure of particulate air pollution, to how likely you are to have these different outcomes, health outcomes. And this is an example of what the, uh, that model might look like if you kind of pseudocode wrote it um, uh, in R, which is the language that he used for this analysis. It's a generalized linear model, which we have tons of theory shows is for this problem the mathematically optimal thing to do when you're fitting a model like this. I can prove theorems for days that that's the best thing to do. But now if you go read his paper, I'm not going to make, don't, you don't have to read every sentence in this text, but what I wanted to do is color code decisions that were made that had no justification behind them as far as I can tell. They picked eight outcomes to study. Why eight and not seven or nine? Nobody knows. They picked five cardiovascular outcomes. Why five? Why those five? Nobody knows. Two respiratory outcomes. Why those? Nobody knows. Hospitalizations caused by injuries and external causes only. That was again a human decision. Uh, the analysis was restricted to 204 U.S. counties with populations greater than 200,000. Again, an arbitrary analysis decision. So if you think about all of the data pipelines and data analysis infrastructure that we're building, what fraction of that are we doing because it's the optimal thing to do versus you heard about it once in a class or your coworker told you that that's what you should do or you know Python so you're using scikit-learn. Those are all cultural human reasons why we're doing data science things and they might have a big impact on the results. So this is uh, adapted from a very famous data scientist named Hadley Wickham. He made ggplot2, if you've heard about that. Um, he has this model for the way that we analyze data. We design and collect it. We import and tidy it. That's kind of data engineering. Then we do some transformation, visualization, and modeling. That's kind of data science. And then publish and communicate. That's sort of business intelligence. So this, for this graph, I can show you the tools that I most recently used for my last analysis. So these are the labeled tools that I used for the last analysis I did. And these are totally honestly the reasons why I chose those tools. And so I think if you went through and took this diagram and looked at the last data set you analyzed and wrote down the tools you used and then wrote down the real reasons why you used those tools, you might also come to some disturbing conclusions about why you made those choices. And so I think that this is the sort of central hypothesis that we want to study. How do we actually do something better than my advisor told me or I made some bad life choices about my plotting software and now I'm stuck with it forever? So we wrote this paper a little while ago, me and some other statisticians, about five ways to fix statistics. You could very easily replace it with data science or artificial intelligence. And the key take-home message I wanted to make in this article is 
we need to appreciate that data engineering, data science, and data analysis is not purely computational algorithmic. It is a human behavior. Humans are doing this. And humans do all sorts of weird stuff. And they do it for all sorts of reasons, some of which are super good and some of which are super confusing. So the people that have learned about this the most are actually people who work in data visualization. They've actually knew about this for a long time. This is not news to the data visualization people. You may have heard that statisticians and data scientists hate pie charts. So there's a reason why statisticians and data scientists hate pie charts. It's not just that we don't like circular things. Um, so it comes from this study. Um, suppose we have a sample with 30 lawyers and 70 engineers. What is the probability that Dick is a lawyer? I didn't tell you anything about Dick. I didn't tell you anything about his characteristics. Um, and you might make a decision about whether he's a lawyer or not. Now I'm going to tell you another, another story. Dick is a 30-year-old man. He is married with no children, a high man of high ability and high motivation. He promises to be uh, quite successful in his field. He is well liked by his colleagues. Now what is the probability that he's a lawyer? So it turns out when you ask these two questions to people, they will report that Dick is an engineer way more often in the latter case than they will in the former case. You'll note we didn't say anything about technical expertise. We didn't say anything about his engineering capability. But people r believe that he's more likely to be an engineer if you describe him in this way. Similarly, they've done experiments where they show people plots. In this plot, we have five chunks in the pie chart, A, B, C, uh, D. And we have five bars, A, B, C, D, and E. On the, if you look at the pie chart and I asked you which is bigger, A or C, it would be relatively hard for you to tell me without cheating and looking at the bar chart which one is bigger. If you look at the bar chart, however, it becomes much clearer that A is just slightly larger than C. So it turns out if you do experiments on actual humans and ask them questions like this over and over again, you can collect data. And if you look at the error that people make in pr predicting accurately whether A is bigger than C, if you show them a bar chart, they're way more accurate. Their error is way lower than if you show them a pie chart. And that's the reason why statisticians hate pie charts, because when you show them to people, they can't accurately pull the information out of them. We know this because we did experiments on humans to prove it. This experiment was done on 100 undergraduates at uh, Harvard, like 1970s. It's been replicated on like 500,000 people in Mechanical Turk in just the last couple of years. So it's about one of the most robust psychological results we've seen. So we've been thinking about this. We think of that. Uh, activity is a human data interaction experience. We've done a lot of these experiments for visualization, but there's all sorts of other parts of the data science and data engineering pipeline where we don't have any data and we don't know how they work. So the first thing we did is we looked at, we used observational epidemiology. So we can go out and collect information about how people do all of this. If you look, for example, if we focus on the modeling component of this pipeline, there was a group that sent out the exact same data set to 27 different expert data analysis teams. They then asked them to answer the exact same question using whatever methods they liked. Then they plot here in this graph the different answers, the different quantitative measures of what the answer to that question was from the different groups. So you can see every group got a different answer. Nobody got the same answer. And sometimes the answers were wildly different. These are 27 highly expert data analytic groups that all got different answers. So what's going on? We wanted to uh, start to do this in our own lab. And the way that we did that is we actually have this kind of amazing laboratory for doing these experiments. Um, and the laboratory is we, over the last few years, have been teaching data science classes on this massive online open course provider called Coursera. Over the last few years, we've enrolled over 6 million people in the classes that we um, offer on that program platform. And we often enroll up to 150,000 students a month in our uh, classes. So we have this amazing laboratory to study what data scientists are doing. I was just realizing that my very first Coursera class, the advertisement I made when I first sent it out was a Prezi. I actually made a Prezi for it. I was made it in 2013. It's still out there on the web, the landscape of data analysis. And I couldn't figure out a way to embed it in my slides today, but I thought it was kind of cool, the, like, a cool connection to have that happen. So I remember very distinctly having a conversation with my colleague, Roger Pang, the one we picked on earlier. And I said, wouldn't it be amazing if we got 2,000 people to learn statistics the day after we decided to all launch these Coursera classes? Mind you, we had no idea what Coursera was. We had no idea what it could become. So we were pretty excited if we could get this kind of number. 
The next day, the day after the class is launched, I emailed our educational uh, developer and I said, hey, Roger got the numbers for his class. Could you tell me how many people registered for my class? And he wrote back, 7,000 students had registered the day that the class opened. Now, mind you, the biggest class I had taught before then was 30 students, so I was free freaking out a little bit. I forwarded this email to Roger Pang, the guy we picked on earlier, and as a supportive mentor would do, he sent me back a message that described his sentiment. I was definitely worried about how we could handle this, but we've managed to pull it off, and we've managed to launch and run these massive courses, and now we're gonna use those courses as an experimental lab to understand the ways that people do data science. So the people that take our courses come from all over the world. They're very highly concentrated in New York City and San Francisco, but they're also all from all over the world. Um, and so one example of what we can do with these data is we can go, for example, to this course, Getting and Cleaning Data, that we teach. This is sort of like um, introductory data engineering for data scientists, very, very introductory. Um, and so this, this class, Actually, this class and the other classes we teach actually drives the global distribution of our GitHub repositories. Every day before our assignments are due, the number of our repositories created on GitHub worldwide spikes. And so we've, we um, have a huge amount of information. We make everybody turn in their assignments on GitHub. So we can go back and look at those assignments they turned in and we can study other parts of this process. Remember, we've, we've studied visualization before. We've, some teams have studied modeling a little bit, but now we can do things like study how people import, tidy, and transform data. So for this getting and cleaning uh, project, at the time we did this analysis, there were 35,000-ish GitHub repositories that people had submitted with their code for this final project. So we can go and study what people do. So we're gonna take these repositories and we're gonna analyze the code in them. And the way that we do that is we have these packages that we develop, our packages, that will both spy on what people do when they do data analysis, obviously with their permission, um, and then also allow us to analyze the data that we collect. So for example, we can pull in the script that they wrote and get a nice tidy data set that tells us when they performed each different operation in the console and what they performed and what are the arguments to that um, uh, function call and so forth. So what we can do is do things like this. We can plot on the x-axis here you see time, um, a, a representation of time, and then on the y-axis you see how frequently people call different packages. And if you look carefully, there's one clear outlier in this chart, and that's the dplyr package. For those of you that use R, dplyr is an amazing data manipulation package that simplifies a lot of data manipulation that you would do in a class like this. It's no wonder that it becomes really popular. Um, and so one interesting thing is we observe these global trends in what packages people use based on the code that they're pushing to, to GitHub. And so this is good for measuring popularity, but it's also good for picking out what are packages that people might use. Unfortunately for us who teach the classes, dplyr was released the exact same day that our getting and cleaning data class was also released on the internet, and therefore rendered most of that class obsolete on the day that it was released. Thank you very much, Hadley Wickham, who released that package. We now monitor very closely all the R developers <laughs> that w uh, might be developing packages for the classes that we're gonna release. Um, but it, it, this is like the observational epidemiology of, of human data interaction. But we can take it a step further, just like you do A-B testing on a website, we can do A-B testing on data analysts and see what happens if we give them one set of instructions or a different set of instructions, see if one thing improves the way that people analyze data or, or doesn't improve the way that they analyze data. So I'm gonna start, we, the first one we ran just to make sure we were making sense was about visualization and communication. I wrote a blog post, a very ill-advised blog post about my bad life decisions of not using ggplot2. If you're not from the R community, you won't realize the absolute level of commitment that people have to ggplot2. But I learned this very quickly because everyone on the internet wrote massive responses. 538, famous data scientists, flowing data. Everybody uh, came out of the woodwork to tell me what a dummy I am. Um, so I had been writing a data science blog for years and never got that kind of traction. But you say ggplot2 isn't OK, and the entire world comes down on you. So I wanted to test, was I completely crazy for doing this? So we ran an experiment, and all we did was we gave people a data set, and then in blue you can see we randomized people to either tell them build the graphs with ggplot2 or build the graphs with R. So this is an example of the base R graph that they made. 
And this is an example of the ggplot2 graph they made. I recognize from these two, the ggplot2 one is looking a little bit better. But we collected then information about, we got peer-reviewed grading on all, of differ all the different plots, and then we regraded them by a team of uh, experts at Hopkins. And we looked at how frequently um, is the plot visually pleasing? How frequently can the plot be understood without a figure caption? Are the legends and labels sufficient to explain what the plot is showing? And consistently, ggplot2 is just like a tiny bit better than base R. So my bad. On the other hand, they're very, very close in terms of how well people could perceive the graphs from either plotting infrastructure. So I felt a little more justified that maybe all that hate wasn't necessary when I put my ggplot2 uh, uh, paper up. So the way that we do this is we randomize people to get different versions of questions in the Coursera program, uh, platform. So this is a variation on a particular question, and it might say you got the ggplot graph or you got the base R graph. So we can do lots of other trials using this. So another example of this is with communication. So you may have heard the phrase, if you've thought about data for a little while and talked to anybody, that correlation doesn't imply causation. Um, and so we wanted to study how people actually under, like, took that to heart when they were reading about analysis. So we um, wrote this little description. We take a random sample of individuals in a population and identify whether they smoke and if they have cancer. We observe that there is a strong relationship between whether a person in the sample smoked and whether they have lung cancer. We claim that smoking is related to lung cancer in the larger population. How many people think that this is a causal, an, an, answer, an analysis where we can make a causal claim? Nice. Okay. How many think association only? Correlation only? No one's brave enough to answer my question. I love it. I know it's Friday. I won't make you, uh, uh, hold you in suspense. The idea here is that we actually don't have enough information. It wasn't a randomized study. We don't have any information about how they did the study design. We can't make any claims about it being causal. And for the most part, people in the class got it right. 16.6% .6 of the people called it causal inference. Most of the people called it inferential. 16.6% .6 represents the rate at which I'm really bad at teaching people about causal inference versus association because this they should be able to, everyone should have got this right. So this is like the baseline rate of how bad a teacher I am. So then we add this, half the group got randomized to see this extra piece of text. We explain we think the reason for this relationship is because cigarette smoke contains known carcinogens such as benzene and makes cells and lungs become cancerous. This extra description, again, doesn't say anything about this experimental design, doesn't say anything about how we should be doing, whether it's causal or, or association, but double as many people thought it was a causal effect just by virtue of us explaining why we thought that effect happened. So that's kind of, a, for us, that's a big uh, important point. And it, what it demonstrates is that we can have unintended consequences about what people think our data analysis was just by trying to explain it or just by trying to add more information or context. So this is kind of disconcerting for us because we have to explain our analysis to people all the time. And we're a little bit laissez-faire about how we describe the explanation and everything like that. We're very careful about how we describe the analysis. But it turns out how you describe the explanation, the additional interpretation can have a big impact on what the recipient thinks about your data analysis. So then we can also look at things like modeling and publishing. So in uh, our field, there's something called p-value hacking, which is basically trying to get a really small p-value so you can get your paper published in a fancy journal. And so I have, this is, no joke, clipped from an email of a collaborator not to be named at this conversation where I said the p-value was greater than 0.05, we won't be able to publish, and they wrote back this. So I'm not the only one that gets this. There's a lot of people that get this kind of pressure to try to publish. Um, and so what we started to do was do experiments around can we prime people to find results or not? So we um, randomized people to analyze a data set, and in, uh, they either got a data set where there was a signal or where there wasn't a signal, and then we randomized them to get um, uh, a little prompt that said, hey, by the way, we already know that there should be a signal in this, by the way, before you start analyzing it. So like half the people saw that little prompt and half the people didn't. So it turns out when you tell people that there should be a signal in the data set, and then they go analyze it, they find the signal more often than if you don't tell them. I mean, that seems like it makes sense, but think about the last time somebody you worked with, whether it was your boss, 
an executive, a marketing director, kind of primed the pump for what they hoped you would find in the data analysis before you actually started doing the data analysis. And you'll imagine that this is having a big impact on the results that all of us are reporting and using in our uh, both academic and business worlds. This is a big bioethical issue in the United States. It's actually coming to the fore, where biostatisticians, people like me and in my department, are frequently pressured to come up with results in order to get them into journals. This is a survey that showed that many biostatisticians had experienced that same thing. Um, so then the next thing we were trying to figure out is, okay, so we can randomize and figure out this, that, and the other. The next question is, can we actually influence human behavior? So similarly to doing different, you know, making an A-B test so you can try to see if people will have a higher click-through rate on an ad or something like that. Similarly, we're trying to see if we can tweak human behavior to do the right thing in data analysis by doing little nudges. So we started with this mo uh, modeling and publishing example. And so what we did was we um, uh, went and looked at this problem of p-hacking. So again, p-hacking is you can make a bunch of changes to your data analysis, and you can get a small p-value, you can get any p-value that you want, um, and report it as significant. There's a similar thing in machine learning where if I'm optimizing on a training set, I can always get perfect training accuracy if you let me do whatever I want to it. And so it's sort of a similar problem of you can wildly overfit data sets if you want to and get whatever answer you want, even though that answer might not hold up if you did another study again or something like that. So we did another study here where um, our study was to, uh, to study how income varies across different ca uh, categories of college majors. We, will, we would give people data from a study of recent college graduates, and we had them do regression modeling to try to figure out if there would be um, anything that they uh, ha could discover from this data set. Um, and then half of, the, uh, half of the people in the study get this little nudge. So this is, again, this is our effort to do a little A-B test to see if we just give people a little bit of a warning to say, hey, you should probably stop p-hacking, it's real bad. Will that be enough to stop them from p-hacking? And so it turns out, no, that is absolutely not enough. And people p-hacked like crazy, regardless of whether we told them that it was a bad thing or not. And so uh, this was a very interesting experience for me because um, I'm usually the person analyzing the data. People are coming to me and I'm saying, I'm sorry, your experiment failed. We didn't find any significant results in it. And this was a case where my graduate students were analyzing the data that I had collected and they had to come and have that same conversation with me. Like, I'm sorry, Jeff, like it didn't work at all. We found nothing. And so that was a little bit depressing. Um, we've since started to launch additional experiments where we're trying to figure out what are the ways in which we can kind of I uh, push humans to behave in the right way when they're doing different kinds of data analysis or different kinds of data engineering tasks. And so the, the interesting interplay is we're both doing research to figure out what are the right ways that humans should do those tasks, and then we're also trying to figure out ways to nudge them to do that the right way. But the kind of incredible thing about this whole area is that there really isn't very much information about either of those things. So um, this is a, a plot where we just look at the number of times they fit a linear model for that same study. And we did see something interesting, which is when we warned people not to p-hack, they did fit slightly fewer linear models than the other group. The thing that was a little depressing is they just figured out different ways to p-hack. They didn't p-hack with linear models, they just p-hacked with something else. So um, we had a tiny influence on human behavior, but it wasn't the influence we're looking for. And so it's, it's really interesting for us now to start designing more of these experiments to try to figure out if we can nudge human behavior in sort of a better or a right direction to get people um, going, in the right, going on the right path. So when we model data, this is like a really simple representation of the way that we model data. We say that the outcome is a function of some covariates that we've measured and some error, where we assume that error is sort of due to random noise in the world. But it turns out that, there's some, that we also have to study what we call researcher degrees of freedom, or basically what you call analyst variation. You can tell people you have to analyze data in a very specific way, and then give them a recipe and say it has to be done this way, and then you don't have analyst to analyst variability as much. But then you lose things like the ability to detect outliers or the ability to detect when there's an error in the data coding. So what we have to do is build models now that take into account the fact that you analyze the data or you analyze the data or I analyze the data will give different results. 
So how do we actually do that if we're doing this in practice? The way that we do it um, at my research group and at the company we founded is we have two people analyze every data set that we do, sometimes three, and then we compare the results that all three get without them having to talk to each other in advance, and then we often observe that they get wildly different answers, and then we have to go back and debug why that happened. So I think it's, uh, it's uh, underappreciated that whoever you have building your machine learning model or whoever you have doing your data analysis pipeline is having this big influence on what the answers are you're getting out of that data. And then the other thing that we, we've been doing is so we sort of started these experiments in these data science um, courses that we uh, offer on Coursera. And the main Coursera sequence, the one that has the most people and the one that's like the most famous, is this main data science sequence that has 10 courses. Um, this is an old number. It's, it's the one that now has 6 million enrollments. But we've also taught all these other kinds of classes. So we taught a course on mastering software development in R. We taught a class for executives called Executive Data Science that teaches people how to manage data scientists. And we teach one on genomic data science that's focused on genomic data analysis. And so one of the things we want to do is start studying how different people in different communities think about data analysis, because each different group thinks a little bit differently. So we've realized that there are these data analysis subcultures. If you got your, if your PhD was in physics and your PhD was in statistics, you'll get very different an, uh, answers. But the people that all got their PhDs in physics tend to cluster closer together than the people that got their PhDs in statistics. So there's these data analysis subcultures that we've identified that do data analysis differently and come to different answers because of their cultural background. And so, and, and not like they're, and you know, that's not, not a, even talking about their actual, like, their actual cultural background. We're talking about their data analytic cultural background. And so, not only do we have to model the analyst, we have to model, like, where you came from. Like, where is your background? Who, what kind of analyst did you hire for your job is, gonna <laughs> is going to determine what are the results that you get from their data analysis? This is an unbelievable iceberg underlying everything that's going on in data science and machine learning right now that we're not completely, haven't completely wrapped our heads around and only a few people are, are sort of studying. So we ran what we call the P-Hackathon. So to try to figure this out, we created a little uh, website, we invited a bunch of people to join, and we gave them a data set, and we said, your job, forget the rules, let, throw all the rules out, get the smallest p-value you can possibly get. Hack away, like go to town on this data set. The only thing you can't do is you can't like obviously cheat. It has to be something that you could write in a method section of a paper and plausibly get it past a rev referee. So for example, you can't just take the p-value and divide it by 100 bajillion and get a tiny little p-value, that's not gonna fly. But you can drop any covariates you want, move outliers up and down, do whatever, pick covariates to put in your model, whatever you want. And so we turned people loose on this and tried to see who could get the smallest p-value. So this is an example. We collected everything that they did while analyzing the data. This is an example of the complete analysis performed by one of the data analysts. Very short and sweet. They got a relatively small p-value even with this one swing at the fence. Um, but then some other people did a lot more. They did all sorts of things. They tried different models. They tried different fits. Um, and then we started to build tools that did basically natural language processing on this code to assign it, just like you would do sentiment analysis on text to say this word is a positive word or a negative word. We created a database of labeling different functions and function types with what part of the data analysis pipeline they were a part of. So whether it's part of the setup, whether it's part of exploratory data analysis, whether it's part of data munging or data cleaning, whether it's part of data modeling, whether it's part of doing so sort of summaries of the model fits and evaluations and things like that so that we could break down for each individual person how much time do they spend on each different task and how does that relate to other covariates that we collect about them. What is their previous data analysis experiment? What field do they come from? Uh, what, what do they think about the answer beforehand? So we can collect all that information and then start to describe data analytic behavior as a function of who the person is that's actually doing the analysis. So this is all work that's like in progress. So I'm just gonna show you one um, little bit of results. So this is one of the scripts. This was labeled automatically. It's relatively, I think it's relatively well labeled even though we used sort of automatic natural language processing to label the different parts. You can see there's a piece in there if you read our code, which you might not. Um, there's a piece, that, there's a place where the last purple line where it says T apply, 
uh, you might start labeling that stuff as uh, data cleaning or data munging and not exploratory. So it's a little off, but we think it's relatively accurate in terms of explaining where things are going and wh what things are uh, a part of. So here was uh, uh, an interesting result. We had many, many people take this data analysis. We made no requirements. This was not on the Coursera sequence. This was like launched out into the wild. So we had everybody from like professors to people who work at big tech companies to first year data science students all doing this analysis. And so here's something that's really interesting that we noticed. So this is just one result that came out of this. It's that we asked people, do you day to day do data analysis in your job? And so some people said yes and some people said no. And among the people that said yes, who do data analysis as part of their job, you'll notice a couple of interesting things. First, they spend uh, obviously less time setting up, which makes sense. They should be better at that because they do it day to day. But they spend that extra time doing exploratory data analysis, which I thought was interesting. They don't spend it necessarily um, and, and doing modeling. Um, they do a little less on import and things like that. And then they also, the people that do data analysis day to day were the only ones that spent time doing the communication part of the pro problem. If they didn't do data analysis day to day, they just got the p-value and stopped right there. So it's sort of interesting to see behaviors like if you've been working as a data analysis, uh, in a data analysis role for a little while, you're starting to realize that communication is something you got to do even when you haven't been asked to do it. Um, the other thing that's really interesting, it, it doesn't show it here in this graph, but in the, the full set of data, you can see for exploratory data analysis that there's this really interesting behavior that um, uh, you sort of see this, this behavior where uh, as you kind of move from inexperience to a little bit of experience, you get more exploratory data analysis. Then once you're sort of medium experienced, the exploratory data analysis drops back off. And then once you're really experienced, the data exploratory data analysis becomes like the biggest fraction of what you do. So there's these weird patterns of behavior that correlate with how people are experienced, with what field they come from. So it's really interesting, for example, that people who came from a, psycholo a psychology background or statistics background would have way more um, uh, expo exploratory data analysis rather than somebody who came from an engineering uh, background or a computer science background did a lot less exploratory data analysis. So again, we're seeing these subcultures. So it's who you are, where you came from, what you do day to day, and who you learned it from all have an impact on the answers that you get when you're doing uh, data analysis and data engineering problems. So it's, we think this is completely fascinating. It's a, a, it's a kind of a scary but exciting uh, project that we've worked on. And so we think that the AI paradox can be explained because the A in AI is not artificial, it's actual intelligence. There are people under the hood doing stuff, running around, trying things out, and those people vary. There are some people that do it one way, and some people do do it a completely different way. And so when you see that variability, you get variability in the answers. And so you can explain the methods being technically pure and mathematically optimal, and the results being wonky and weird by the fact that there's a human in between those things that has to make a lot of decisions. Um, so we think that if you, you know, how should I analyze data? We should use data to study how people analyze data so that we can have them analyze data better. First thing to keep in mind is that I just showed you a bunch of data analysis. You don't know what my particular biases are, so you would have to <laughs> study me to figure out if you believe anything I just told you. But hopefully it was at least entertaining. Um, one thing that I would uh, mention is that this is like a huge collaborative effort. There are people in my research group, they're alumni of the research group that now work at tech companies and things like that. There are collaborators in other research groups at Hopkins and other places that all made major contributions to this. And then the other th place that we're doing a lot of this is at this company that we started, Problem Forward Data Science, where we have multiple analysts analyze the same data set and compare their conclusions. And we're learning all sorts of things about the way that pipelines are built and what the variability in those pipelines are from, from looking at how this happens in real world applications. You think it's just an academic exercise and you'd be right for being skeptical of an academic saying things like that, but we observe these exact same patterns in all of the pipelines that we have with companies that we work with externally. And so we think this is a universal problem, not just a, you know, nerds in the uh, academia problem. So um, with that, I think I'll wrap up and thank you very much for your attention and for sticking around so long for the talk. Cool. Thanks so thanks. much, Jeff. Yeah, thanks. Got a lot of questions coming in, but it's never too late. Please please send in your questions on Slido, and don't forget to rate the talk. Get things started. Do you have any recommendations for online courses in more advanced data science or statistics? 
intro courses are easy to find, but too basic for our needs. Yes, so it depends on what you want to learn, but there's um, Brian Caffo from Hopkins teaches some pretty advanced statistics classes that we teach to our PhD students on Coursera. So you could take those. They're called Mathematical Biostatistics Boot Camp or something like that. And then Andrew Ng has some pretty advanced machine learning classes that, they, that he runs on Coursera as well. Um, but if you want to get into like PhD level courses, uh, universities for the most part haven't started rolling those out online very much, but you should keep an eye on my department, Johns Hopkins Biostat, because there's this discussion about putting our entire PhD curriculum online. And so if that happens, then you'll have as many advanced classes as you want. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah. Have you yourself used Coursera courses? I have, yeah. I've used uh, Coursera courses. I like, you know, I'm a statistics academic, so I've spent uh, time in the, the courses that I take are often in like business and stuff like that because I started a company, I don't know what I'm doing. So <laughs> that's good um, to know. Do you think it will be easy to publish something that shows your original hypothesis is actually wrong? Um, sure. <laughs> I don't know which hypothesis they're referring to. Uh, I think I it means in general, like, if I was a person publishing and then, oh, it turns out that my hypothesis is wrong, would I still be able to get published? Yeah, and so we, you know, I think one thing that's very hard for academics is that your livelihood is tied to getting results, and so a lot of academics are incentivized very strongly to publish things. I think this is very true that you can do that, and I think the, there's stuff that, like, pre-registration and things like that that are sort of moving us away from that, but... Um, yeah, I, and you know, I think that the thing we need to do is reduce the stigma around that happening. Like yeah. if I publish something and then later I find out, oops, I was wrong, I should be able to say that without having to like hang my head in shame. It's better for the field if I tell people when I figure out I'm wrong, but it's not currently good for me if I do that, so. Right, so just be brave, pioneer the field. How do you balance your time between, <laughs> how do you balance your time between actual scientific research with your hoppy research of analyzing people's analysis? <laughs> Uh, I'm not sure what hoppy research means. I, I hobby. think of this it as surely real means hobby. happy research. I think it's, I, uh, I consider this, I have a NIH grant that supports this hoppy research. And so it is part of my uh, academic portfolio. It's, it's actually half of my research group does what I would call statistical genomics and things like that. And then half does this kind of stuff. So I consider it part of my real research. Okay, well we've got yeah. that officially now. Don't you risk not getting your recommendation letter if you don't follow your advisor's advice? Yeah, so some people get really nervous about that. And so what we've done at Hopkins is to try to provide cover for people like that. And so the best thing that you can do is if you have a, this is true at a company too, if you're the data scientist and you're discovering something wrong with the data that's like causing problems, you need a more senior level person who can be run interference for you. It's the same thing in academia. You need a more senior professor that can run interference for you if you discover something wrong in a statistical analysis. So often people in my department get, get that's like a big fraction of our job is like running interference for more junior data analysis people in different groups. Okay. Um, but the political part of it is where the action is for sure. Okay, good to know. Um, do you have any advice for data teams on how to be more conscious about the social processes influencing analysis or model development? Yeah, I mean, the, the thing that we found is the best is, you know, people do code review, which I think is great, and that, that's a, a way to uh, detect some of that. But I think really, I know it seems like a waste of effort, but having multiple people do the same thing, if you can afford it, is really a good idea because you'll see which analysis always comes to the same conclusion no matter who does it and which things are wildly different and maybe you shouldn't rely on them. So, but that's an expensive proposition, so it kind of depends on how important that analysis is to your team. Okay, yeah. okay. Um, what is your opinion on the obsession with p-values in scientific research? How can this issue be tackled? Speak a little more on this. Yes, exactly. Um, uh, I think that p-value obsession is weird and we spend so much time thinking about that and not all the other stuff that could be causing an analysis to go wonky. Like, it's way more likely that you read in the data wrong. Like, there was just recently, unfortunately, a retraction of a paper in one of these famous medical journals because uh, the original people who collected the data coded people who got the treatment as one and people who didn't get the treatment as two. And then in the stuff of nightmares, the analyst relabeled it as zero and one, and the zero and one relabeling meant it switched the treatment and control groups. And so all the results that they said applied to the control group actually applied to the treatment group. So this is like a data scientist, like it'll keep you up at night sw uh, sweating if you hear that story. Um, and so I think all that stuff is way more important than like what's the variation in the p-value at the end of the day. So 
I, I, I think it's we shouldn't be so obsessed with it. Okay. But okay. I'm in the minority. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, you might have made some converts. Yeah, I hope so. Um, is data table versus wow? I'm gonna now we're one in the minute. weeds. Is data table versus Dippler war over? Yes. Uh, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> so there is. So this is like really in the like now we're really in the cultural wars here. So this is. The R in the R programming community, there's two ways that you can process relatively large data sets that kind of, they're sort of like SQL-like approaches to processing data sets in R. One is dplyr, written by that famous person, Hadley Wickham, and one is data table, and uh, uh, written by uh, um, a, g a gentleman from Australia whose name I'm, I'm totally spaced on, and now I'm going to be part of this war, which I really don't want to be a part of. Um, they, both of them are awesome. We use data table all the time. We use dplyr all the time. They have slightly different features, so depending on what you want to do. But um, as with all of these things, like Python versus R, ggplot versus base R, opinions are very powerful and very important. And I guess I'm in the camp that's like, just use whatever tool gets the job done and is okay for you. Uh, but, you know. I'm, yeah, I'm trying to stay out of that I one. I think that's pretty reasonable. I'm trying Middle to be of the road very advice. political and stay out of that one. Yeah, You've done well. Um, have you done studies on Python adoption for stats, statistics? So that's a great question, and no, we haven't. All of the classes we teach online are in R. So um, that being said, we've we've had a ton of conversations about this because we think some things there's some things we kind of hypothesize that Python might be a little bit better for, and there are some things we hypothesize that R might be a little bit better for, and it'd be super interesting to have the comparison between those two. The problem is finding people who are equally fluent in the two. It's very hard to find people who are native in both R and in Python. Um, usually people are a little stronger in R, or a little stronger in Python, and so you'd imagine that those effects would swamp the effects of what the actual tools differences are. And so we haven't come up with a steady design that's clever enough to figure out how to do that yet. But if somebody has an idea, I'd love to collaborate on it. So. Okay, very interesting. Um, what are skills or capabilities you look at when recruiting data scientists? I mean, it's going to sound ridiculous, but like the ability to use Stack Overflow and Google, <laughs> um, like, y you know, it's, uh, uh, you start off with, uh, you know, you, you look for them to have the basic technical skills and that they're friendly and that you can work with them. And then uh, I think it's sometimes a little like ridiculous to get into the weeds of very specific, like, can you use this package or library or do you know this particular algorithm or data structure? Because the more important thing is that they probably won't have to use that specific one. They'll probably have to use whatever we're going to start using in six months when that one doesn't work at our company anymore. And they're going to have to figure out how to do that. And so adaptability is uh, the, the thing that I care about the most when we're interviewing people. Yeah. OK, well, that's good to know. Um, are there any techniques to unbias my understanding of the analysis as an information recipient or not bias my audience as an information presenter? Yeah, so that's what we're trying to figure out. So this is the thing that's really tricky is I wish I could say, yes, these are the top 10 things that you can do. But we, those studies that I just showed you about the causal inference language, that's, to my knowledge, the very first study ever done on causal inference language in that way. And so we're, I think we're at the beginning of figuring this out, not the end. In the, in the short term, the way that we do it is by making sure we compare what different people think and that, you know, if everybody's coming to the same conclusion regardless, it feels like it's it's probably the closest to unbiased we're going to get. Okay, well, on that note, we're out of time. Great. Thank you, Jeff, so Thank much for such much. an interesting Appreciate conversation. It. And give this Thanks, on behalf of the oh, conference. Awesome. Thank you.